to Your Ethiopian Professionals Know Your Rights series. Today we will be discussing the pathway for international students and professionals to have um, a visa and uh, we have an expert in, immigra in employment immigration expert here with us, Shirley Tang. Shirley Tang is with CTSW Law Firm. She's a partner and has more than 20 years of experience in advising businesses on recruitment and retention of global talent. She is a strategic resource to human resources and talent management professionals in securing work visas, including H-1B, TN, L-1, O-1, and others, and permanent residency green cards through employment sponsorship. Her clients represent a broad range of industries, including information technology, pharmaceuticals, finance, healthcare, hospitality, and manufacturing. And I can go on and on about Shirley. She is excellent, and we're very lucky to have her and her expertise here today. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Shirley to give you an overview of uh, what our discussion is today. Thank you, Shirley. Okay. Thank you, Malay. I'm going to speak about uh, the immigration options for professionals um, who are on, in the U.S. on visas. Uh, and we're going to talk about a little bit about the types of visas that are available and um, what is the general course that a foreign national, um, what's the normal course that they go through in the life cycle of getting from getting here in the United States until they re obtain permanent residency. The ultimate goal is to get a green card from your residency. So uh, we will now backtrack and start with how does one come to the United States and how does one maintain lawful status in the United States, eventually go to school, work, and be sponsored for permanent residency. And we're gonna talk about each step and all the nuances that are integral to each, each of the processes. So what we're going to talk about is three is basically three sections. So the first section will be who is authorized to work in the US. Um, the second uh, aspect that we're going to talk about is what are the common work visas that are available to uh, recent graduates as well as professionals. Um, and also then you know, the last thing we're talking about are the options for green card permanent residency. <coughs> so, so we'll start by saying, okay, by um, talking about, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, who is authorized to work in the United States? So typically, typically you have US citizens, green card holders, uh, refugees, asylees, as well as immigrants who are authorized to work. Also authorized to work are non-immigrants, and these are foreign nationals who come to the United States with work visas. Uh, and sometimes they don't start immediately with a work visa. You may start immediately, initially, with a student visa. So what is a visa? A visa is really permission to come to the United States. And with that, each visa has a purpose. And so each visa will have a non-immigrant side, which is the temporary. Um, that's what I call alphabet soup, because that is associated with every letter of the alphabet, including S for snitch. And that is something, that, that is a real visa. It's a visa for witnesses who are going to testify against a drug cartel, a cartel, like in the uh, years ago with the Noriega trial, there were a number of S visas that were issued for witnesses. And there's a T visa for uh, victims of trafficking. So oftentimes the, oftentimes the visa, the, the alphabet has some relationship to the type of, of uh, purpose of the visa. And then their immigrant visa is the green card. So there's two types of visas. There's non-immigrant and there's immigrant. And this is the fun part because then it becomes like, okay, there are all these little alphabet soup, okay? On the non-immigrant side, uh, you see it here, 
This is all the non-immigrant visas that are available to foreign nationals. This is not of all of them. These are just the main uh, visas that are available to work or to come to the United States. So you have the tourists who come on vacation. Uh, you have the business visa visitors that come for conferences or to scout out um, business opportunities or even to interview for jobs. You also have uh, student visas, that students that come to the United States on F1 or an M1, and we'll go into further detail about those. Uh, and for certain countries, there's what's called visa waiver. There's tw about 26 countries around the world that where the visas are not required. Um, you can come into the United States for 90 days, and it's reciprocal as well. Like Americans can go overseas to those countries for 90 days, mostly European countries. So we're moving over to the non-immigrant side, the employment. Um, and we'll talk about each of these visas uh, further down, but I just want to give you a snapshot of how this, this landscape of immigration looks like um, when you talk about immigrant side, and then you also talk about the non-immigrant side. And over here is the immigrant side, and the U.S. system is really three prongs. It's employer-sponsored, it's family-sponsored, and also there's diversity lottery. Um, Ethiopia is a country that is, is eligible for the diversity lottery. The diversity lottery is given to countries that have lower immigration rates. And in order to encourage the immigration from those countries, Congress set up a program called Diversity Lottery that allows a certain number of um, individuals from those countries to emigrate to the United States through a lottery system. So let's move on to the typical pathway of um, in, in non, a non-citizen coming to the United States. Oftentimes they come in with a F1 student visa. And once they complete their course of study, they will then transition to a visa, a work visa. Usually it's the H-1B visa. And we'll talk about more about what the criteria is to qualify for each visa uh, in the next few slides. And then ultimately, the jackpot is the green card. So let's go back and start talking, let's talk about F1 visas, student visas. So a foreign national can come to the United States to attend university, college, high school, private elementary, seminary, conservatory, and ESL. Uh, they can get an F1 visa. An M1 is available for vocational, um, such as culinary arts. Um, they can come in for um, music programs, uh, they can come in to um, maybe for uh, some engineering type of courses, uh, but it's non-academic. And once a student is enrolled in a in the student in the F1 program, after completing 12 months of a program, they have the opportunity for OPT, which is optional practical training. Uh, there's two types of OPT. There's pre-completion and then there's post-completion. Pre-completion is um, similar to an externship where they can work 20 hours. After the first year, they can work 20 hours in an externship or an internship where they can get paid 20 hours a week uh, on campus of employment. And with OPT, they need to have an employment authorization document. That's a work permit. Now, when the individual has graduated from the F1 program and they have, let's say, their bachelor's degree, uh, <clears throat> they get OPT, post-completion OPT, for 12 months. And if this individual then studies, uh, studied a STEM major, and the employer is enrolled in E-Verify, then that student can extend their OPT for an additional 24 months. So those graduates who studied a STEM major 
and their employer is enrolled in E-Verify, they can potentially get three years of OPT in the United States. In the meantime, they will um, hopefully transition to a more longer term visa such as the H-1B. And while the individual is still enrolled in school, if they are allowed to participate in curricular practical training, CPT, um, and that is, again, similar to an externship where they can work off campus. They can work uh, like a financial analyst. They're studying, let's say somebody's studying um, business administration and they want to do a internship at the at a, a investment um, investment business. That individual can do 20 hours a week under a curricular practical training because that, that job that they're seeking uh, is related to what they're studying and they'll get credit for it. So uh, the individual will be able to work 20 hours a week during school and 40 hours a week full time uh, during school holidays. Now CPT does not require the employment authorization document. Um, so that is uh, something that employers often don't know about. Um, and it is authorized by the school um, on the, a document called the I-20. So, um, and then uh, the other thing that the individual on OPT is eligible for is um, if they are selected in the H-1B lottery, and we'll talk about that next. Um, there is a provision that helps them cover any gaps. So for example, if the student's uh, OPT expires on June 1st, uh, but the H-1B takes effect on October 1st, there's a provision that allows the, the, the individual to work during that gap. It's called H-1B cap gap, and they're covered from um, June 1st until uh, October 1st. Let's segue to the H-1B now. And uh, it is the most common visa. Um, it is also the most sought after. Some of you may have read some horror stories of individuals who have waited four or five years with this lottery and ultimately have to make the decision to go home because they were not selected in the lottery four years running. And it is very sad because they see their colleagues get picked on their first try. And it's, it's heartbreaking sometimes because there is no other option to stay here because it's so expensive. I mean, they can enroll in other programs, but bottom line is tuition is very, very expensive. So H-1B is a lottery system because the demand is so high. There's only 65,000 visas available every year. And uh, there's an additional 20,000 allotted to um, graduates of US masters or higher programs. And the lottery opens in March of every year. It runs about three months, uh, three weeks, sorry. It runs about three weeks. Usually this year it ran from March 1st to March 18th. And then on March 31st, immigration does uh, what they call random selection or AKA the lottery and then notifies the employers on April 1st that um, they were picked. If the individual doesn't hear from immigration, if the employer doesn't hear from immigration, that means they were not picked. Immigration does not notify those that were not picked. They only notify those who are picked in the lottery. And then the employer has 90 days to submit the application. Um, to give you an idea of the, the, the sheer volume of demand, immigration received 400,000 registrations for the 65,000 plus 20,000 slot of, of a H-1B visas. So a lot, I mean, it's about, it's probably less than 30% chance of getting selected. So if they are lucky to be selected, um, the employer then, um, the employee can start working for that employer starting October 1st. And again, if there is a gap in the employment between the expiration of the OPT and the start of the H-1B, 
typically the H1B cap gap will cover that so that the individual does not have to stop working. There is a six year limit on the H1B. And so it's, um, which is why it's oftentimes on, their, on the mind of the individual, the employee, they're thinking green card. That's the first thing they think about when they interview for the job. They're like, I, I need sponsorship, but I also need sponsorship for the green card because they know that six years goes pretty quickly. And um, with, the, with, with the H-1B, the individual is allowed what's called immigrant intent, and that is the intention to come to the United States to work temporarily, but also to pursue permanent residency, and that's allowed under the H-1B program. Um, one thing that I always tell employers about the H-1B um, visa is that immigration can do site visits. They can show up, not so much now, post-COVID, but before it used to be very common for employers to call me and say, oh, immigration's out front, they want to see the employee, they want to see our HR records, and that's totally permissible. They don't need a warrant, they just come in. And they're very nice, generally, they're not here to arrest anybody. Um, since COVID, um, it's the whole, this, this site visit is now done by email. And where they do ask for the employer to send proof of the payroll records, they sometimes want to talk to HR, they want to talk to the individual to make sure that they are working in the job that is reflected in the file. Um, there was an example of this is I have a client in healthcare and so uh, it's in a nursing home and the individual was sponsored to work as a physical therapist. So what immigration did was in order to, instead of interviewing the individual, they just sat in the corner and they watched them work. They watched them work and perform the job of a physical therapist. So that is another way of how they would want to see to make sure that the individual is, exact, is in fact performing, doing the job that the, uh, it's in the paperwork that was submitted to immigration. Now with the H-1B, there is a document that's very important. It's called the LCA, uh, Labor Condition Application. And it, it's a document that the employer has to keep on file uh, at the premises, and it must be also made available for public inspection. So, I mean, I have yet to hear about somebody from the outside coming in to demand to see the public access file of uh, an employer's LCA folder, but under the Department of Labor guidelines, anyone in the public can ask for a copy, even employees, even U.S. workers who are at the employer's site. Uh, so an employer must maintain the LCA and, um, and a copy must be given to the employee as well. Um, not so much now, but again, pre-COVID, Department of Labor did a lot of audits where they actually go into a company and say, I want to see your public access file of all the LCAs that you have for your H-1B employees. So that completes our discussion of the H-1B. Any questions so far? Okay, and then, so I want to talk about a little bit about other types of visas that are available. For example, if someone has already exhausted their opportunity to get the lottery and they haven't been selected, what are some of the other visas that might be available to the individual? So we always like to have backup plans. So one thing that, um, that Ethiopia has is unique, uh, along with many other countries, is a treaty with the United States for trade and commerce. And that is the E1, E2 visa. And um, E2, E2, E1 is uh, a treaty for trade. So for example, um, someone who makes, uh, let's say there's, um, you know, let's just use a, a widget as the example, or a software 
okay, somebody who is creating a software platform in Ethiopia and wants to sell it to the United States, um, to businesses here. That is a possibility of getting an E1, however, the individual must um, show that there's significant trade. So they have to show that there is purchasers lined up in the United States um, who are ready to buy this product from them. Uh, an example of an E1 um, is Turkey, for example, is a E1 country, and Turkish rugs is a huge commodity. So that's a, that's another that's a good example of how you know just think about the product that's made overseas and then sold to the United States, and at least fifty percent of the sales have to be with the treaty country and the United States. The E2 is an investor visa. And that's a little more difficult sometimes, especially for someone who is maybe even studying in the United States and a young professional. Um, the E2 is a treaty that, uh, where the individual st starts up a company in the United States. And to do that, you need capital. And you have to show the money trail of where this money is coming from. So this money can be a gift from family, it can be inheritance, it can be sale of property, selling of cars. Um, typically, it's, it's, a, it's savings. Um, and depending on the type of business, um, you know, you can have, you can start up a business with fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, depending on the business. Um, if it's like a social media platform, you don't need a whole lot of capital for that to run. You don't need a whole lot of staff to run that. So in, in, in that way, it's, you kind of have to look at the type of business compared to the amount of investment that's put into it. I generally advise clients, regardless of your, um, regardless of your business, 100,000 is probably a good benchmark for an E2 visa because you have to capitalize the business for at least a year you have to show that you can pay rent. You can hire. You have a business plan to hire employees, um, and you have office space. is not so not so big thing anymore, as we all know. Remote work is um, the most popular option, so it's not necessarily uh, important to have an office. Although it's a good idea to have a lease to show that you have office space, because a lot of immigration officials are still thinking old school. Um, so the E1, E2 is a potential option if the individual has run out of H1B, F1, and they still want to stay in the United States and they have the opportunity to create a business or to, to procure some income, um, capital or a gift uh, where they can invest in a business. So that is something that we often discuss with the client to see if there is another option to stay here. The other, another option, a good option, is the J-1. Um, J-1 is for exchange visitors. Um, they're also for interns and trainees. The disadvantage of the J-1 program is that the, the State Department runs the programs, and the State Department looks at the individual's experience and uh, they want to see the individual's foreign experience more than the U.S. experience. So, if you have somebody here who's been working as a um, who's been working as a student on OPT, then and they run out of time, that individual would have a hard time getting a J-1 because the whole idea is that they're coming to the United States on the J-1 to learn the business to learn about the product, to learn the business model, how business is done in the United States, and then bring that knowledge back to their home country. So if the individual has been in the United States for a good amount of years, has, had, has been to here to school, has, um, has had OPT and worked here, then likely they're not going to really be able to gain any benefit from participating in the J-1 program. And for that reason, the J-1 is not a great option, but it is an option if they're overseas and you want to bring someone here. 
So oftentimes you may have heard about the au pair program. So au pairs are also on J1s and they get it for 12 months to take care of uh, young children. Usually they're between the age of um, 18 to about 26, the candidate. And uh, that's, that's a very common um, use of the J1 program to be an au pair. Um, also, if there is like students that want to do an exchange program in the United States, just like you know when you were in college and you had an exchange program overseas, similar to that, there's the reverse, where a foreigner would were, uh, come into the United States to participate in a six month training, 12 month training, uh, and even sometimes 18 months. So that's, a, that's one option that is available if the H-1B is not available to, to them and they're overseas. Um, the L-1, L-1A, and L-1B, I threw in here because there's potential that, um, that these are multinational companies. So let's take an example of a multinational company like uh, L'Oreal, for example. They're a French company and they are, they have offices and businesses around the world. So if you have a employee or you have an individual that works overseas, let's say in Germany, and they've been working there for five years and they're transferred over to the United States, that would be an L1 visa. So that's uh, may not be a, a real, um, it's not a real option for many students who are here who have again lost out on the lottery and have no other option but it's something that they can look to to build for example if they interned at l'oreal and they say oh you know maybe i can work in the french office uh, maybe i can work in england or london and and they work there for a few years and they work themselves work, work their way up to become a manager then potentially there's an opportunity for them to come back to the United States as a manager. And this is the fun one. Um, where is it? Oh, sorry. The O1. O1s are fun. They are artists, um, scientists, educators, business people. The O1 is somebody who has extraordinary ability. And what does that mean? Um, in the arts, it means it means that they have achieved a high level of, let's say, a painter, a painter, a um, you know, a musician, a pianist, a jazz musician. That is somebody who can qualify for an O1, and the the criteria is a little. Um, immigration has given the arts a little bit of a leeway. And instead of saying that you have to show extraordinary ability in the arts, you can show that you have distinction. And that means that really they are above, above average. So they have been recognized by their peers. They've been recognized by their mentors. They've been recognized by the public. They have um, you know, music that they've put out. Um, so in the arts, you have you can have anywhere ranging from uh, performing artists. You can have a journalist. A journalist can, can be a is considered the arts um, because journalists write, and writing is an art. So it's it, even though it doesn't seem that way, but um, and editors also come under the arts. So for those individuals that have again lost out on the lottery and lost out on, um, ran, ran out of OPT time, ran out of H-1B options. Um, the old one is a good way of looking at and say, look at your resume and see if there's a potential for an old one visa. Um, once in a while, you find a gem and it works. Um, but so this is, that's, that's an option. And the P is a, similar to an O. It's more like for, um, uh, I use it the example of baseball players. They are part of a team and they're coming in to play for the Yankees or the Nationals and they need uh, and they need a visa. So P would be, they don't have to show that they are so well known uh, and they don't have to meet the criteria of the O-1, 
but they have to show that they're renowned and they're known. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some PVs on the on the Nationals team or any of the, the DC teams. Um, and lastly, there's other visas that I want to share with you uh, that may or may not be applicable because you might have someone who has dual nationality. So it's always good to ask, you know, what do you have any other nationality? Do you have hold any other passport? Uh, because there's special carve outs for Australians, Singapore, Chilean, and Canada, Mexico. So those countries have specific visas that are work visas, and you don't have to go through the lottery for them. So it's oftentimes I ask, you know, is there any chance that you have a citizenship of another country? Okay, moving on to green card. That's the prize. Um, and the, again, the the way that this U.S. system works, the U.S. immigration system, is purely employer-based. Um, with the exception of a few, there's a few. So for example, in the, in the first preference here, um, the, the, the categories that do not necessarily require an employer is extraordinary ability in arts, science, business, education, and sports. Now, Earlier, we had talked about the O-1 as the, a similar visa, but the O-1 is the non-immigrant side. It's a temporary work visa, whereas this is now the green card. So extraordinary ability, I uh, used the example of a rocket scientist or a cancer researcher. The, that's the type of level that you're looking at, the top 5% uh, of the industry. Nobel Prize winners, uh, Pulitzer Prize winners, those typically are the ones that get the extraordinary ability. You don't have to have an Emmy or an Oscar necessarily, but it's that's the criteria they're looking for. Um, so that does require that does not necessarily require an employer to sponsor. An employer who has reached that level of achievement may self petition. And the other um, category where you do not necessarily need an employer is national interest waiver. And that is, uh, again, somebody also in, usually in the pharmaceutical, in the, in the chemistry field, where they have been working in a very uh, targeted uh, research area that could benefit the United States. And it's not just science. It can be economics. It can be business. Um, it can even be science and health, uh, especially now. So these are the two areas. These these are the two categories that may not may not need necessarily need an employer, but every other sponsorship of the green card does require an employer to sponsor them. So if you have somebody working as a researcher, for example, um, in the pharmaceutical industry, they may qualify for an outstanding. A researcher or even a tenured professor can also qualify as well. Um, multinational executive, that is somebody who comes in, let's say, again, you look at um, the L'Oreal example where the individual has been working overseas, has been transferred to the United States um, to work temporarily on a work visa, and they are pursuing a green card now. This is the conversion of that non-immigrant visa to the, the green card visa. Um, and so there's, this, is, this is just, you know, we don't have to go through each one of these, but this is just to give you an idea of the types of categories that are looked at. And if you go further down here, I mean, you will probably see like kind of a totem pole effect where you start at the bottom is unskilled worker. And that's somebody like a custodian that's being sponsored and where you don't need a lot of experience. Uh, you maybe need six months experience. Then you go to a skilled worker that needs two years experience. That could be um, uh, maybe a short order cook. Uh, it can be somebody who is um, maybe uh, doing uh, bookkeeping. Um, and then you go move up to professional where the job needs a bachelor's degree. So you kind of see that you know on top, the fastest way to get a green card is first preference. 
and then you, slower and slower until and then third preference. So um, this is this is really just a snapshot of what are the types of green card sponsorship that's available to a foreign national. And then we have family-based sponsorship. Um, that's marriage to a U.S. citizen. Uh, sometimes I feel like I am a matchmaker. I always ask the question, is there anybody special in your life? And sometimes, you know, I'll be surprised, say, yes, I am, you know, my, my, we're thinking about getting married. I'm like, great, let's, let's go, <laughs> let's do it that way. Um, so that is a family, uh, family spent, this is family-based immigration. So that is uh, if a U.S. citizen sponsors their spouse, child under 21 or parent, that's immediate relative. There's no wait time for that. Uh, family preference, there's a wait. Uh, so each of these categories, there's a several year wait for that because it's not an immediate relative. Uh, and then, of course, there's the fiancé. How many of you have seen 90 Day Fiancé? How many of you are addicted to 90 Day Fiancé? <laughs> and they even have a new program, 90 Days After. <laughs> so that's the, um, it's, it's never that dramatic. <laughs> but it's fun. And lastly, the diversity lottery. Uh, Ethiopia is an eligible country for the diversity lottery and I always tell clients beware of scams because you wouldn't believe how many websites out there say we guarantee you a green card all you have to do is pay five thousand dollars I had a client who paid fifty grand he's from Germany he paid fifty thousand and he keeps telling me, I'm waiting for my green card. I'm like, how? <laughs> I got in touch with, I said, send me the name of your lawyer. And uh, he sent me the information about the organization that supposedly sponsored him. And I sent an email saying, oh, you know, let's, let's get on a call. I never hear from them. He never hears from them again. And he says, we don't talk to lawyers. <laughs> so. So beware of scams with the lottery. Use their website only. Apply to the Department of State website only. There's no fee for the application. So any site that tells you that they charge $500, don't use them. Do it yourself. Use that link and um, beware of the scam. Okay, so that wraps up my presentation. Um, and I'll open it up to questions. What advice do you have for workers who have a little bit of experience? Because mm -hmm. going back to your slide, I mean, they have a bachelor's degree, they have, they have two years of experience. Like, they could really, like, act, they could initiate the conversation, right? So it's yeah, like, yeah. Uh, it's, you know, uh, it's harder for an Indian national or right, right, someone right. from China yeah. that have backlogs. Uh, how do you know that this is a company you want to spend 10 years at, right? Right, exactly. So if that's not the case, you know, if he's... If right. Most in other countries, it's not. But what I often tell people is, you know, you don't jump into the green card right away. Unless there's a reason to. You know, let's say you're running out of time. The H-1B is for six years. Let's say you're on year four and a half and you're desperate. So maybe, okay, you bite the bullet and say, talk to your employer and go ahead and get started on the green card. But if you're on year one and you just graduated, first job, you know, you're going to move up eventually, you know, you can advance in your career. So maybe it's not the right fit to start right away. So I always tell some, most, most of my clients I tell, wait a little bit, make sure you find your footing, make sure you find where you fit. And once you find where you fit, and then that's the place you want to stay and invest your time and grow, that's when you, that's the company for you to start the green card. But you're right, I mean, they tend to, a lot of employers will take advantage yeah. of employees and say, oh, I'll pay you this much because I'm paying for your green card. And meanwhile, their colleague is paying, is getting paid you know, like 20,000 more. You know, the US worker is getting 25 to $50,000 more. So that, I think some, that's the reality. I don't think there's a way out of that just because that is the process. Yeah. It's good to know upfront also during yeah. the interview process 
to see if that company sponsors foreign nationals for green cards because that could make your decision whether to accept this offer or the next offer. And uh, do I have to stay working at that company after getting the green card or is it just my on leave? That's a very popular question. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the number one questions I get. And the answer is yes. You do have to stay working for the company at least for, I would say, you know, give it good faith. You know, if another offer comes around and you can't resist that one, it's a, it's a chance of a lifetime, then take it. But at least work for the company for hmm, three, four months. <laughs> you know, the whole idea is that you should be working for the employer. Um, but if another opportunity comes after you get the green card, there's nothing to hold you back. Uh, the reason I always tell clients to that they definitely have to work is because Five years after getting your green card, you've been a permanent resident, you can apply for citizenship. And on the citizenship application, there's a look back of five years. So immigration will look back on the application and say, oh, you know, your company, you were sponsored by ABC. I see that you work for ABC for, you know, right after you get your green card. So they do look back at that record. So that's why I always tell people, yes, do work, but if an opportunity comes, or even even worse, I mean, in the recession, you have um, hiring freezes and you have layoffs. Uh, I've had clients that where they were sponsored for the green card, but as soon as within even before the green card got approved, they were laid off, which really is is bad news. But that's the reality. That's another reason why to get started as soon as you can, but also make sure that it's the company you want to stay at. Uh, generally, 18 to 24 months. And this is including the Department of Labor part? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, right now it's taking longer and longer. Um, just like every industry is having a shortage, labor shortage, Department of Labor is experiencing the same thing. So I have noticed in the last six months that things are taking longer, processes are taking longer. You, what used to take six months is now taking eight. So that timeline could get longer and longer, but as of now, it's taking 18 to 24 months. Next year, it may be three years. <laughs> but this is an excellent market for, the, for those labor certifications, because if a foreigner is working, the employer is having a hard time finding talent, this is a great time to ask for the green card sponsorship, because likely you, they're not going to find an American that's qualified and willing to work in this job. So, yeah, where did all the employees go, right? <laughs> and does everybody uh, file at one Department of Labor, or is there multiple ones for like the US? Uh, what do you mean, different jobs? No, no, I mean like, let's say somebody filing in DC and somebody filing in Texas or in Cal here. Oh, like geographically? geographically? Doesn't really matter because it goes into one central database. Okay. So it really, being in any state, I mean, I, I guess look at, you know, I mean, some states have a higher industry in a particular area, like auto, for example, so you have more engineers being up you know, for that location, but it's not state-based. It used to be, years ago, it was state-based until Department of Labor centralized all the, into, into um, it was in Georgia and now it's in D.C., so. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, it typically is 20, 18 to twenty four months. But if there's an audit, you can you can definitely add ten to twelve months to the processing time. And um, Department of Labor in this labor certification process, it's all electronic. So Department of Labor never sees the employer, never sees the employee. All they see is an electronic submission, and so they kind of have to take your word for it that the employer did all the things that they said they did, including the ads and the postings and all that. Um, so in order to do like quality check, Department of Labor will randomly select cases for audits. And it's about maybe 25%. 
you know, I'm thinking maybe same as the IRS kind of level of auditing uh, risk. So, um, but there are things that we do as, because we know the industry, we know what Department of Labor looks for, we try to keep away from anything that could trigger an audit. And what could trigger an audit is something like if uh, a language, a foreign language is required. If a foreign language is required for the job, even if it's a, a, an interpreter, likely immigration will audit the case because that's just automatic audit trigger. And um, so we tell cl clients that have like managers that are, let's say, responsible for Latin America and Spanish is required. I said, okay, we have to show emails, we have to show contracts, we have to show um, cell phone records that they're calling Latin America every day. And um, so when, when you do, when you know that there's a language requirement, you always prepare the case in advance knowing that it's going to be audited because 10 out of 10, it will be audited. Um, and what the Department of Labor wants to see are, is that the employer actually went through the process. It's, it's really just quality. They want to make sure that employers are posting the ads because, again, when they're looking at the case that's filed electronically, all it is is dates that the employer says they advertise. There's no backup. But in the audit scenario, they want to see the backup. Well, let's, um, an example would be, um, let's say they don't, uh, they believe that there's U.S. workers available. Uh, this happened to me a couple years ago where it was a business analyst for a local company in Manassas. And um, it, they, they, we did, we went through one round of audit and the Department of Labor said, oh, we believe that there's enough U.S. workers for this job. So what they did was they did supervisory recruitment. And that is a process where Department of Labor tells the employer, you have to advertise in Washington Post, in, in another paper, and you have to post on Indeed, LinkedIn. Um, there were used to be, uh, I think, another site, different sites, America's Job Bank. You have to post in all these different forums. And it costs like $3,000 to post all those in those forums. And it had to be their ad. It had to be like this long ad with everything about the job in the ad. So your employer's paying like a couple thousand dollars just for the Washington Post ad. But supervisor recruitment is a way that Department of Labor can come back after an audit and say, we believe there's sufficient US workers for this job. And we, but we want to, we'll give you a chance to show us that it's not, and we will do supervisory recruitment. And in that case, we got 50 resumes, and we were able to identify each one, and, and the employer had to call each one and explain why this person was not qualified. It's very tedious and long, and there's high risk of denial because with that level of scrutiny, you could easily, Department of Labor can easily say, you know, we don't believe that this there's lack of Americans for this role. So they could do that, or they can, um, if they believe that an employer has not completely complied with the advertising, they can blacklist that employer for a series of months or years. I have three questions for you. Uh -huh. The first one is I fall into the category of advanced uh, degree with five years experience. Do I still need employer uh, or I can petition for myself? The second question is about uh, uh, 90 day fiance. I came late, I apologize for that. I heard you mentioning this, so uh, tell me more about that. If I date this girl for uh, three months, then uh, uh, she can file for me or how does that work? <laughs> the last question is about uh, essential worker. I have worked in a COVID site for one year and uh, three or four months. And by then there was a rumor uh, that I heard uh, that this uh, Congress is going to approve essential workers to get the uh, green card. So I asked my supervisor to write a recommendation for me and he wrote uh, a 
very good recommendation, mm -hmm. supporting my application to get a green card as well as citizenship. So, yeah. uh, which uh, uh, out of the three options, which one do you think is the best option? Thank you. Okay, let me see. I'm, tr I'm going to try to repeat your question so that the audience can uh, get that I can actually understand it, make sure I understand your question. So the first question is, can you sponsor yourself if you have five years experience? What is your, what is your occupation, sir? What kind of job? COVID. A COVID scientist? No, I work as a brain surgeon. Okay, so uh, with regard to the essential worker, that's a rumor and that's something that's kicking around in Congress. There's nothing concrete, no, it hasn't been signed into law. So unfortunately, that's not an option right now. Um, fiance, that is a possibility. Um, however, you do have to return home to your country to finish the processing. So it's taking now, so if you were to get engaged and your, uh, your fiance is a US citizen, then that process is a two, a two prongs. The first prong is there's a petition that's filed with immigration. And right now it's taking about a year for that petition to be approved. And once that petition is approved, that petition is then sent overseas to your home country and that's where you apply for the visa. So that may, I see you're shaking your head, that doesn't look, that sound <laughs> too promising. <laughs> So I think the best thing for your employer to do is if your employer, if you are in fact, you know, if you are, since they wrote a, uh, a great recommendation letter, you are a valued employee and it would be probably a prime, prime um, opportunity for them to sponsor you in a labor certification for the green card. Because all the other ones don't seem to be um, as beneficial or as uh, the likelihood of success is not as great as, as the one that you know, if you were to be sponsored by the employer. Um, about the fiancé visa, um, I mean the requirements of like going back home, is it only for like uh, immigrants who cross like border or is that for like everyone? I thought like as long as you have like valid visa, as long as you maintain that uh, valid status, and as long as you have a um, passport which is not expired from back home, I think, is there, is there any way to make some adjustment of status without going back? You actually raised a good point, and I want to uh, add to amend my statement to that gentleman. If you were to get married to your fiance now, you can apply for the green card here in the States if you entered the country legally and you can show that you had you had a visa with your own passport and uh, it doesn't matter how long you've been here, you can be here 20 years, um, you don't have to be in legal status. If you get married to a U.S. citizen, you can get your green card. But it has to be a valid marriage. So, um, so your question um, is the similar, is very similar to his scenario that if you are engaged to a US citizen and you get married here and you came here legally with a visa, you can adjust your status. You don't have to go back home. The, the fiance scenario is very much like the ones you see on television, the 90 day fiance, where they meet by the introduction online platforms and then they talk and then eventually the US citizen goes overseas and meets their fiance and decides that they're going to do the, the process. That's generally how a fiance visa works. Rarely does the, the two parties meet here, or sometimes they do, but they often have to go back home. Um, does that answer your question? Um, I think so, yeah. I mean, I'm trying to make the distinction between like people who, uh, immigrants who keep their status and enter to the U.S. legally. Mm -hmm. And I think the, requir the requirement of like going back home is for... Uh, yeah, if, 
they enter, right, if they entered illegally, if they entered without inspection through the border, they have to go back home. And they have to apply for a, a waiver, a provisional waiver, uh, in order to get back into the US. Because if someone is here illegally for over one year, and they leave the United States, they cannot come back for 10 years. So um, let's say somebody who crossed the border in 2015 and now is married to a US citizen, that individual will have to go back to their country, but because they've been here for so long, they, they're subject to the 10-year bar, and they will need a, a waiver in order to come back sooner than the 10 years. No, yeah, yeah, no, it's so long as they came here legally. The, uh, uh, you bring, bring in a good point about um, J1s. J1s, um, for example, J1s who are here like physicians, the foreign graduates, um, the doctors who are on J1s, oftentimes they're subject to a two-year residency requirement, which means they have to go back home for two years. It's part of the contract. Um, if they are subject to that two-year foreign residency requirement on the J-1, even if they marry a citizen, they can't adjust their status. often like to start planning and start having that discussion with the green card as soon as we, as soon as I meet the client for the first time, I have that call, I'd like to find out their whole history and say, okay, how long have you been here and how long you had your H-1B and, you know, and if they tell me that this is year five and they haven't started the green card, then it's like a race because you're, you're, you gotta beat the clock on the time is ticking. And it can get very stressful for the employee, for the employer, um, and, and for the attorney, because they're looking to us for guidance and to make the process faster, which we can't, because Department of Labor is taking longer and longer. So um, to your point about you know what can an individual do, um, it's planning, it's all planning. So having that discussion early on with the lawyer and making sure that there's, the big picture is looked at. And um, because there's, there's like, for example, if you say, okay, I have five years left. Okay, well, if you've been outside the country for during your five years that you've been on H-1B, if you've spent, let's say, every year you go home for a month, that's six months that you are able to get back. It's called H-1B recapture. So you can get back every day that you have not been in H-1B status for a 24 hour cycle. Going to Canada and coming back doesn't count because if you go to Niagara Falls and you come back, that's not 24 hours. But if you stay in Toronto, that's one day, overnight. And so that would count, but um, so that's a, that's a way to plan. Look, if somebody has, is in their fifth year and only has a year left, the question is, have you ever traveled? And, how, and try to recapture as much time. If they haven't traveled at all, and we've had clients with that don't travel at all, they haven't gone home, and because of COVID, they couldn't. We say, okay, well, you better start traveling now. <laughs> go, go make that, you know, you ask the employer, can they work overseas? Can they work in Canada? You know, can they work again? We had, I had one client where every weekend, he was going to Canada, every weekend for like three months in order to get back those days. So it's, it's a lot of planning.
Right, the, the employee cannot be involved in the recruitment, but the employee should be knowledgeable right. about what's happening on the case. Oftentimes I like to have, um, I like to have these like status calls set up by the employer where I have HR and I have the individual and it's just 15 minutes, like every month, 15 minute call just to update on what's going on. And we use that opportunity to kind of plan out, okay, what happens if this, what happens if that, what happens if you have a child that's 19 and the process is taking two years and this child will lose out on your, your green card sponsorship once they turn 21. So it's a lot of planning in, involved. And I like getting on those status calls and I suggest that any employee that's going through the process try to get into that program where they can have HR have calls, status calls. And not every, not, not every employer will be open to that because some employers like to keep control of the process and they're not open to having communication. So it's really dependent on how your employer perceives the process. But I find that the more informed the individual is, the better they perform as workers because they're not hung up on the process. They're not hung up on, or they're not spending their day online looking up, you know, different things, going on forums and talking to other, their friends. And, because friends are probably the worst people to talk to. <laughs> they are. They they're great for you know fun and all that, but they're bad for they're really bad, especially if they're going through the immigration process and you start talking to them and their case is going faster than yours. Then it's never fun. <laughs> never a fun. I always have this. My clients always have the story. I have a friend. Their case started later than mine, but they got approved already. <laughs> So, so I, I do encourage um, transparency. And if they're not, um, if the employer is not transparent about it, um, there's really not much the employee can do other than just to try to find out as much as they can where they are in the process and what's happening. Because I think if they don't hear anything, they feel like nothing's being done. And that's the fear. You know, but oftentimes it's really just Department of Labor being backlogged and delayed. <laughs> yes. Well, I think because of the cycle of, um, because of the way that the, um, it, because of the way the lottery cycle works, generally the individual's EAD will be, ex if they, it does, ex and, they, and because graduation usually happens in May, oftentimes the OPT, the EAD, starts in June. There is situations where they, they are not covered. There are situations where um, OPT ends in February and they get into the lottery and uh, so they, they can't stay here. The gap doesn't cover someone who is, who's, who's someone whose um, OPT or EAD ends uh, outside of the window, that six month window. So if the lottery is, so April 1st is the day one of the H-1B submission. If the individual has uh, their EAD expires, um, let's say their OPT expires June 1st, then the cap gap would cover them to October 1, right? But if their EAD expired March 1st, then it doesn't cover them and they have to go home to get their visa process. They can still get the H-1B, but they can't get it here. How long does that take? Um, that is a good question because with all the delays caused by COVID, a lot of consulates are backed up and they're just, I mean, things have reopened at least since um, earlier this year and they're just inundated with backlogs from two years earlier, from 2020 when everything shut down. 
they're still facing the consequences of that. So it's it's not easy to get an appointment. Anywhere from 90 days and up is what people are looking at in terms of timeline. So, but because the start date of the H-1B is October 1st, uh, there is a priority given to H-1B workers who are starting October 1. So the consulates around the world have allocated extra visas and extra date appointment dates for people who are on H-1Bs to, uh, to get their appointments done so that they can fly in and start working on October 1st. To hear your question. Can we even consider H-1B available for everyone? Well, uh, India does take up 50% of worldwide visas. So, um, and you have like Microsoft that files 25,000 H1B registrations and they take up the bulk of it. That's why the numbers are so high. But I mean, it's up to Congress. They haven't changed the program in 20 years. So we're stuck with the lottery system, unfortunately. That's why it's good to look outside of the H-1B and consider other options, um, like the E-1, E-2, the investor visa, the trade visa, um, the O-1, if they have a skill to work here. So it's good to look outside, think outside the box, especially with the lack of H-1B visas. The H-1B lottery? Yeah. The H-1B lottery is, um, it's supposed to be, uh, it's random selection. How is it random if the majority of the... Well, I guess it's percentage. Let's say, you know, out of the 400,000 registrations that were received by immigration, let's say 300,000 were from Indian nationals or companies that like Microsoft or Facebook or Google were submitting um, dozens, hundreds of, th hundreds of them, or thousands of registrations for Indian nationals, then it's going to be skewed, right? The data will be skewed. Yeah. yeah. other than what we talked about, um, the two visas that don't require employers, the two green card processes that don't require uh, an employer is the national interest waiver, which is a high level, it's hard to, it's not easy to attain that level of achievement, and the extraordinary ability. Um, so again, that's a high level of achievement that's difficult to attain. Um, as far as the everyday individual that's working here on a H-1B, looking to stay in, in the U.S., the only option is to either an employer sponsors them or they get married and uh, their spouse sponsors them or a family member. Um, family members is not always ideal because if you have a sibling that's a U.S. citizen and the sibling sponsors you for the green card, you could be waiting 12 years for that process. So it's not always the straight from the F1. I've, ha I've seen this happen where a uh, F1 is go straight to the green card uh, with a self-petition because they have this talent that no one has. Um, you know, it's very, very rare that you, because you, in order to achieve that level of self-petition ability, the extraordinary ability, you have to have a certain amount of years of work experience and recognition in the industry. However, if you are one of these um, like genius savants that have created this particular platform that 
has taken off, like say, for example, Facebook, for example, use that as, if a foreign national were to create that, that would be a p potential opportunity for someone who's a student here, and they came up with this great idea, and they launched it, and it took off. That's an extraordinary ability. Someone like that could do a self-petition and say, I created this, I generated this million, this X number of millions of dollars in my uh, for my business, created all these jobs. Um, the other thing that I've also I haven't spoken about is for green card is um, it's called EB five, and that's the multi million dollar investment. It's one point nine million, <laughs> but it does result in a green card. And uh, it takes several years, but it does require that the individual invest in a business, uh, generate 10 jobs for Americans, or the lesser one is like 900,000 in, um, in a struggling business or regionally, um, a regionally challenged area. So, um, but again, 10 jobs for Americans. Uh, not great odds, right? I mean, for the everyday per worker to have that ability. But yes, your, to your question, it is possible to jump from F1 OPT with the EAD to green card. It's not, not as rare though, but it can be done. And the chances of that being successful for a second time preference are assuming pretty low. Um, for the second preference, like national interest waiver, it depends on the occupation. It depends on what the person's doing. If they can show that they, their work, let's say they come up with an algorithm that will solve um, the energy crisis or the inflation crisis, um, then then that could be second preference. That could be a national interest waiver. Thursday evening. Appreciate you making the track. Thank you all for participating. Let's give her a round of